Okay, so let's talk about immunization. Well, what is immunization? Um, immunization is anything that provides specific immune response to a host. Um, and with specific immune response, we are talking about uh, the humoral and cell-mediated response. Functionally, that is almost always going to be the humoral response. There are a few experimental trials on uh, immunization regarding the cell-mediated response, but when we're talking about it, 99 out of 100 times, we're going to be talking about humoral response, and that means antibodies. Not all immunization uh, is necessarily vaccination. Vaccination is only one specific type of immunization, though it's one of the ones that we are more concerned about. Uh, in general their uh, uh, immunity or immunization can be either natural or artificial, and it can be either passive or active. Natural versus artificial is a pretty easy distinction, right? Is it happening through some sort of pre-existent pathway that does not require human um technological intervention? If so, it's natural. Does it require some sort of active human technological intervention? If so, it's artificial. Passive versus active immunity is a little bit of a uh, more subtle distinction. So... In all cases, something is giving you specific immunity, usually antibody immunity, to a thing. The difference between active and passive is that in active immunity, your immune system is being trained to recognize a specific thing. In passive immunity, someone or something else is sharing their immune system with you. This provides the protection, but does not provide the learning function of the immune system. Uh, with active immunity, which is probably what we are more familiar with, Natural active immunity is the immunity that you gain when you become sick with something. And just in the process that we have discussed in previous lectures, your B cells, uh, a B cell that recognizes a particular antigen becomes active. And uh, in the process, it makes memory B cells. And those memory B cells preserve... Uh, the ability to make antibodies against that thing when you encounter it in the future. That is natural active immunity. Your own immune system is learning, and so that learning is carried on into the future. In addition, uh, like we can say it is quote-unquote natural, uh, humans and other things have been getting sick for long, long before we developed biotechnology. And um, it's just a thing that happens and has always happened. So that's pretty easy. That's natural active immunity. Artificial active immunity is primarily vaccination. Uh, this is a human technological intervention. You don't get vaccinated by anything naturally. We had to invent vaccines. Um, but the way a vaccine works is it is going to teach and train your immune system to recognize a particular antigen in the future. 
generally speaking, that antigen is going to be part of the pathogen, which means that when you encounter that pathogen in the future, your body will be ready to respond with an antibody response that will um, hopefully either prevent infection or cut the course and severity of infection down dramatically. So immunity acquired through vaccines of various types is active artificial. In both of these cases, your immune system carries a memory of the experience forward and you develop long-term immunity to the agent. With passive immunity, you are borrowing something else's immune system. Your immune system does not learn in any sort of long-term way, but you get the protection temporarily provided to you. Most cases of natural passive immunity uh, have to do with mothers and infants. Infants are not born with an immune system. Well, they're born with uh, uh, the innate immune system. But their specific immune system um, is not competent when they start off. Uh, even like in very young newborns, uh, their immune system is actually not, or their specific immune system is not functional at all. They actually don't have the B and T cells necessary uh, to even make antibodies. Those B and T cells are still undergoing training in the bone marrow and thymus, respectively, and have not yet become competent to be activated. During this time period, infants are extremely vulnerable to infection. Um, this is usually going to be like the first six to nine months of life. Uh, and there are two main ways of passive immunity during this time period. Uh, the first is um, through IgG. If you recall, IgG can be uh, shared between the mother and the developing fetus because it can pass through the placental barrier. So a mother shares IgG through the placenta with her developing fetus. This helps to protect the fetus in womb, uh, what we would say in utero, but since IgG is the longest lives, lived of the antibodies, after the infant is born, it still has IgG in its blood. And that IgG continues to provide serum protection to the antibody, or to the uh, infant for several months. Um, it's not infinite, um, but, uh, certainly in those first crucial few months, it continues to be present. And the immunity that is shared is whatever the mother is immune to. Um, so if she has received measles vaccination, then she will share that immunity with her infant. If she has had the, you know, um, if she had chicken pox as a kid, then she will share that immunity with the infant. Again, this is short acting because after birth, um, you, those antibodies are no longer being shared, but they stick around for a while. In addition, in the first few days after birth, the, um, uh, the first breast milk that a new mother makes is a, uh, doesn't look like milk. It looks more like a sort of cloudy, clear fluid, and it's called colostrum, and it contains very, very high levels of IgG. So the first breast milk that a baby gets is this highly antibody-laden colostrum. Uh, this coats the inside of the baby's um, 
uh, intestinal tract or, or uh, uh, elementary canal everywhere from the mouth all the way through. Uh, and it coats that with IgG. And in non-human mammals, there's some evidence that the IgG actually is taken up through the intestinal wall and transported into the blood. I haven't found any evidence, any direct evidence that this happens in humans. In fact, it doesn't seem to happen in humans, but it does happen in other animals. The second natural passive immunity is uh, through breast milk. Um, as many of you have probably heard, breast milk contains antibodies that help to protect an infant. Now, a few things to keep in mind. Uh, after those first few days, breast milk contains IgA, the secretory antibody, and it is not known to pass into the blood. So it doesn't provide serum protection, but it does coat the mucous membranes of the infant, and uh, that basically provides the same sort of protection that your mucus gives to you, except it shares that protection with the infant, helping to protect it from gastrointestinal infections, which are um, some of the more common infections that infants can get. Um, they're always putting weird stuff in their mouth, and so like things can get in there through that. Um, like, you know, certainly until recent time and probably even still today, um, I haven't really asked anyone, but I would just take a guess that most women probably don't antiseptize their nipples before breastfeeding. So it's possible that there could be who knows what there. Um, and uh, the antibodies... Uh, the IgA helps to protect the gastrointestinal system from any sort of infection in that way. Uh, it's not known to pass into the blood and doesn't provide serum protection, but it is still a partial sharing of the immune system. And again, what the, the, the infant is going to be immune to in this time is whatever antibodies the mother makes. Now, to debunk a few things that I have heard, which are misinformation. One, you can't share your vaccination with your baby through breast milk, right? If you are vaccinated against measles and you breastfeed your baby, that does not make your baby vaccinated against measles. It only protects them during the time of breastfeeding. Um, and not even for the entire time of breastfeeding, as I'll talk about in a second, but, uh, this is why it is passive immunity. It does not make the, uh, the infant's immune system competent in any sort of long-term way. The infant's immune system, once it develops one, will not learn from its mother. Secondly, uh, this sort of natural passive immunity, uh, particularly the, the, the secretory IgA in breast milk, um, is a temporary phenomenon. And it, uh, it, it's functional while the baby is, does not make um, stomach acid and does not make digestive enzymes, right? So a newborn infant can't digest solid food. Everyone knows this. And one of the reasons for that is that their stomach is not making stomach acid and they are not making digestive enzymes yet. Or at least not making much in the way of digestive enzymes yet. So the, the antibody, which is protein, doesn't end up getting digested. Um, once a, uh, an infant gets on like solids or even semi-solids, usually at around, um, nine months to a year, um, well, six months to a year with an average of around nine months, uh, at this point they're starting to make 
stomach acid. Um, they're starting to make their own digestive enzymes. And now any antibodies that they receive through breast milk are just going to be digested in the, um, in the digestive system and aren't going to provide any benefit. I know a few women who have like continued to breastfeed their kids up to, um, well, let's say very, very late, like say, you know, 11 or 12 years old. And, uh, you know, when I asked them, don't you think that's a little weird? They said, no, it's good for their immune system. And I had to inform them that, in fact, no, that, 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 that part that was good for the immune system stopped after the first six to nine months. And after that, it's just weird. Um, no, I mean, like, you can continue to breastfeed your baby until it's no longer a baby. And I guess if you want to continue breastfeeding it until they're in junior high school, you can. Um, but, uh... But it doesn't provide any immunological benefit after those first six to nine months. Artificial passive immunity. Um, this is uh, most commonly associated with um, antivenoms and antitoxins. So let's say that you get bit by a rattlesnake and you go to the, uh, the emergency room to get some antivenom, right? Yeah, everyone kind of knows about this. Well, what is that antivenom? What they do is they take cow, and usually it's a cow, and they have a rattlesnake bite the cow. And if the cow doesn't die, and honestly, usually what they do is they inject the, the cow with a little bit of rattlesnake venom these days, and they start off with a very low dose and then they increase it as it goes up so that the cow doesn't die very often. But either way, you have a cow and you repeatedly expose it to rattlesnake venom, uh, which is called strychnine. And, um, and it's a foreign agent. So eventually the cow learns to make antibodies against it. And once the cow makes antibodies against this venom, you can give higher and higher doses and the cow will just make more and more antibodies until the cow becomes basically immune to rattlesnake venom. Like, you know, rattlesnake can bite it and it's just gonna give him a weird look. All right, now you kill the cow, you take its blood, and you spin out the plasma and you extract all of the antibodies. Uh, well, you're gonna have lots and lots of antibodies in there against strychnine, rattlesnake venom. And you come into the hospital with uh, a, a rattlesnake bite and what they're going to do is give you an IV with some of this cow's antibodies and those cow antibodies are going to get into your blood and they will bind to and neutralize the strychnine and then the strychnine can't hurt you just like it can't hurt the cat your immune system does not learn to recognize strychnine from this. Like, if two months later you're out hiking again and you, like, tease a rattlesnake and it bites you, you're going to need more antivenom. You have not become immune to snake bites. But for that time period where you do have that cow's antibodies in you, it is sharing its immunity against rattlesnake venom uh, with you. And this is something that has been uh, generalized to a bunch of different toxins. Uh, it's basically, we take something, usually it's an animal, and, um, uh, and it, you know, it train its immune system to be able to respond to something, extract its antibodies, and then inject those antibodies into a patient that that requires them. Um, and typically this has been done with, uh, with toxins, uh, venoms, things like that. Um, although there has been some recent chatter uh, and some recent trials um, with the COVID-19 situation, looking at, at finding people who've had the virus and recovered from it and then 
isolating the antibody from their blood that uh, is that that is the anti COVID nineteen antibody, and uh, making that into a passive immunity injection you could give to people who are sick. So, like, presumably, if you've got the virus and you get better, you have antibodies to it, you have immunity to it. Well, can we take some of your immunity and have you share it with patients who are much more immunocompromised than you are? Old people, sick people, things like that. Um, and uh, this research is uh, really just in its beginning stages. And... Um, it, it can never be a widespread solution because you will eventually reach a point where you're like, you can only take so much blood from the people who've recovered uh, before you start to do active harm to those people because you're basically sucking out all their blood. Um, but in the case of like controlling spread of the infection or controlling the infection in particularly vulnerable populations, um, there is probably a role for this sort of passive immunity. Now, it's important to realize that if you have somebody who, say, gets sick with coronavirus and you have stores of antibodies that you got from people who got better, and so you give those antibodies to the person who's sick and that person eventually gets better, if you treat them that way, they will not have acquired immunity. And it is entirely possible that they can go out and get sick again. So it's not an ideal situation uh, because what we want is for people to become immune to the virus. But it could save some lives and is an interesting thing that people are experimenting with. So uh, active versus passive immunity I basically just explained all this stuff. So passive immunity uh, for natural, we're talking about um, mother's IgG in placental transfer, IgA in breast milk, no memory. Once the antibodies are gone, they're gone. For artificial immunity, the injection of antiserum, which is basically just blood serum that contains antibodies from something that has been exposed to this. Um, it can prevent disease if uh, you have somebody who's likely been exposed. Um, it can limit the duration of certain diseases. So even if you've become symptomatic, um, a good shot of anti-serum can well, if nothing else, shorten the course of the disease by helping to control it until your antibodies kick in. Um, and blocking toxins, whether microbial or non-microbial in source, is probably their most common uh, uh, is probably their most common feature. And there's like two ways that you can do it. Uh, one is basically um, you take uh, hyperimmune globulin, which is antibodies to a specific disease, usually from a specific patient, uh, versus um, immunoglobulin. You just take all of the antibodies that a bunch of people have. Like here we have, you know, you know 10,000 people who've gotten better from coronavirus. We're going to take some blood from each of them mix it all together, we're probably going to take out the, the blood cells first so that it doesn't immunoreact. Um, mix it all together, we're going to extract the IgG, and then, um, and then we're just going to give this whole mixture and hope that it contains something that's going to help you get better. All right. Active, uh, uh, active artificial immunity. So this is mostly vaccines. What do you need to know about vaccines? Well, a bunch of different things, but I'm going to give you the basics here. Um, a vaccine is a preventative. It's usually a preparation of a pathogen 
or its products. So either the whole pathogen or part of the pathogen. And it's used to induce active immunity. Uh, vaccination does not just provide protection to the person who gets vaccinated. Very importantly, it provides herd immunity. In order for a disease to spread, you have to come into contact with vulnerable individuals. Let's say that I am sick with measles and I come into contact with 50 people uh, in a day. Well, if the measles vaccination rate is 99%, then the chances are pretty good that I did not come into contact with a single person who was vulnerable to the disease. And so it will not spread from me to anyone else. Now let's say the vaccination rate is 50%. Well, um, if I came into contact with 50 people in a day, 25 of them could come down with the disease. And we're talking about measles. Measles is probably the most contagious disease ever known to man. And uh, the chances are pretty good that it's going to spread to probably 25 out of 25 of those people if they're unvaccinated. Um, there are certain people who cannot get vaccines, either because they are allergic to it and the vaccine will do them harm, or because their immune system is compromised and like you can get them the vaccine, but it's not gonna produce any good effects in them. Uh, for instance, uh, I have a good friend um, from childhood and his son a few years ago came down with childhood leukemia. So he had to have major chemotherapy, uh, destroyed much of his bone marrow and uh, has had to have repeated chemotherapy throughout the past several years. Um, his son can't be vaccinated, or at least, like, if you tried to give him a vaccine, it wouldn't do anything to him. So he doesn't have any of that vaccine immunity. Um, my friend's son relies on the fact that everyone else gets their shots to protect him. Uh, the, the fact that 99.9, .9, actually, these days, it's going to be closer to, like, 98%, out of 100 people are going to have a measles vaccine means that the disease just never gets a chance to spread. But if it, if there was a measles outbreak, he would definitely get it because he can't be vaccinated. Uh, there are also people who are allergic to various components of the vaccine. Some people might be allergic to a specific vaccine. Some people might be allergic to broad swaths of vaccines, but either way, those people are protected by the herd immunity of the population. Herd immunity breaks down when not everyone or not a specific critical number of people are vaccinated. The more infectious a disease is, the higher the percentage of the population needs to be uh, vaccinated in order to prevent spread. So for something like measles that is extremely infectious, the herd immunity protection number is about 95%. If 95% of the population is vaccinated, then in general, measles, any case of measles will just simply not be able to spread uh, before you um, isolate and uh, you know your immune system does its thing. And you might transfer to a few people, but if 95% of the population is vaccinated, then any outbreak will tend to die off rather than tending to explode. For things that are less infective, like say, um, oh, what's a good one? Uh, pneumococcus, right? Uh, it's a, a, a streptococcus pneumonia. Um, it's less infective. Most people don't get sick from it, uh, you don't necessarily need to have 95% of the population vaccinated in order to prevent spread of it because it's not going to spread as easy. But the more virulent something is, the higher the number you need to have 
vaccinated in order to get herd immunity. Uh, herd immunity in the population is responsible for dramatic declines in childhood diseases. It's even responsible for declines in diseases among children who are too young to be vaccinated, right? So if, you know, um, there are certain diseases that are deadly if they happen in somebody who's one or two years old, but an inconvenience if they happen in somebody who's like four or five years old. And often those things cannot be vaccinated against until somebody's like four or five years old. Uh, but we still vaccinate against them. Why, if it's not all that serious? Well, we vaccinate against them so that, you know, Bobby doesn't bring the disease home from school and infect his little sister, Susan. Um, and Bobby might be old enough that it's probably not going to have a huge effect on him, but Susan might be young enough that she can't be vaccinated for it and uh, the disease is more severe in young children and then she ends up dying. If Bobby got his vaccination, he wouldn't have taken the disease home. So vaccines don't just protect you, they protect us all. Ideally, effective vaccines should be safe, have few side effects, give long lasting protection, be low in cost, stable, and easy to administer. In practice, very few vaccines fit all of these criteria. And um, so there is no perfect vaccine, but there are some pretty good ones, and then there are some less good ones. In general, vaccines fall into two main categories, what we call live attenuated and inactivated. So attenuated vaccines. Attenuated vaccines use a living organism or at least an intact virus, whether or not you want to call it living is up to you. But it has been weakened to the point where it is not capable of causing severe disease in an otherwise healthy host. That's what attenuated means. It's been crippled, right? So uh, often what it's been, uh, it's been mutated to make it grow very slowly, or it's been mutated in ways that make it more vulnerable to your immune system. Um, you know, important genes for replication have been replaced. Uh, but it does still infect cells and does still replicate to a certain extent. The advantages of attenuated vaccines. Um, usually attenuated vaccines produce a much stronger immune response. Uh, and the reason for that is that they get into you and they do replicate. So you may get one dose, but that one dose will infect some cells and will keep producing viruses if it's a viral vaccine or a bacteria if it's a bacterial vaccine, but it keeps producing pathogens for a few days. The pathogens are weak, so they usually don't spread. Um, but that means that you're not just getting one dose, you're getting a constant dose for a longer period of time. And that means that your immune system is gonna have much longer to respond to it, and it's gonna have much more infectious particle for it to respond to. It's more similar to the way a natural course of disease works, and so your immune system responds stronger to it. Um, so usually with attenuated vaccines, they're one and done. You get the vaccine, and then you have long-lasting immunity against whatever you were vaccinated against. Uh, another advantage is that you can actually inadvertently immunize others because it is a little bit infectious. So let's say I go get a live attenuated flu vaccine, 
and then I come home and uh, my immune system is responding to it, I'm producing, again, these attenuated particles, my wife could get, could catch the vaccine from me. I could infect her with the vaccine and then she would end up being vaccinated to it as well. So that helps to increase spread and increase herd immunity. Disadvantages, all right? So a live attenuated vaccine is kind of like, uh, so any disease, any disease is a race between your immune system and the pathogen, all right? And uh, the question is, uh, does the pathogen kill you before you start making antibodies? And with an attenuated vaccine, I want you to imagine, you know that gun that they fire up into the air at the beginning of races? Imagine that instead of firing it up in the air, you point it at the virus's kneecaps and blow their kneecaps off. All right? Who's going to win that race? Your immune system or the kneecapped virus? Well, your immune system's probably going to win it because you kneecapped the virus. What's a circumstance under which the virus might win if you don't have an immune system? So even though you kneecap that virus, it's still going to haul itself across the finish line eventually if it's not racing against anyone. So immunocompromised and immunosuppressed individuals can occasionally be at danger for um, attenuated vaccines. Uh, and... You know, additionally, people who live in close intimate contact with those who are severely immunocompromised might not be appropriate because, again, they could catch the vaccine from you. Uh, this is generally not much of a problem, but this is one of the reasons why my friend's son can't get most vaccines, right? He doesn't currently have an immune system, so it wouldn't help him to begin with. And potentially, the vaccine could hurt him because he couldn't even, he, he's so immunocompromised, he's actually doing fine now. But, like, when he was fighting off leukemia, he was so immunocompromised that, um, that even an attenuated vaccine could be harmful. Uh, it's possible, though quite unlikely, that the virus could revert or that the attenuated vaccine could revert. If, say, let's say we, we did like four mutations in four important genes uh, that, um, that cripple this virus so we can use it as a vaccine. Well, it's possible that the virus will get four mutations in the same four genes that are what we call back mutations, where it reverts to its original form. This is highly, highly, highly unlikely, but not impossible. And there have been cases of it happening. Um, uh, like I said, very, very rare, but it's not impossible for it to happen. Um, attenuated vaccines are generally not recommended for pregnant women. Not because there's necessarily a specific danger, but sort of because we just don't know. Like, we haven't tested most live attenuated viruses in pregnant women, and it's really difficult to get pregnant women to come in and we say, hey, we want to give you this experimental vaccine, and we want to see if it does anything bad to your fetus. Like, most women who are pregnant go, yeah, yeah, screw that. I'm not, you're not doing anything like that to me. I don't. So we just end up not testing it on pregnant women. So we don't know how safe it is. Chances are pretty good that attenuated viruses are pretty safe for pregnant women, but we don't have the testing information to prove it. So we don't recommend it. Um, and third disadvantage is... Uh, they're live viruses and bacteria. So you've got to keep them alive or they don't work. So keeping viruses and bacteria alive means that you usually have to keep them refrigerated. 
Uh, this makes them more expensive to produce, more expensive to transport, less useful in an emergency. Let's say you had a big epidemic of, oh, I don't know, say Ebola uh, in some place where you did not have reliable access to electricity, right? What would be more useful in that circumstance? A live attenuated virus or a, uh, a killed or deactivated uh, vaccine? So if you're going to be sending in a whole bunch of like medical paratroopers to try to squash this, you know, incipient outbreak of Ebola in, um, you know, some place in the world where there just is not reliable electricity um, and you want to get this outbreak suppressed before it becomes a worldwide pandemic, which is usually the best way to go, uh, you know, you, you probably wouldn't want to be dealing with a live attenuated vaccine because you're going to have to send people down with like generators that are going to keep the samples refrigerated and things like that. Uh, that's hard to manage in a crisis situation. Um, so yeah, and some examples of, uh, attenuated vaccines are the measles, mumps, rubella, the chicken pox vaccine, yellow fever, and rotavirus. So some of our classic, most effective vaccines. Inactivated vaccines. These are sometimes also called killed vaccines. They're technically when we're talking about viruses, they aren't alive and thus don't get killed, which is why we call them inactivated. Um, so with these, usually we have, uh, you take a virus, sometimes a bacteria, but inactivated vaccines are usually viruses, and you treat it with something that just like kills it dead inactivates it so that it is impossible for it to replicate. Often you treat it with formaldehyde um, or something like that. Uh, and then you just inject a big load of the, uh, of, of the virus into somebody's blood. Now, what are the advantages here? Well, it, they usually store for long shelf life right? So um, you can stockpile it. You can like buy 20,000 doses of these sorts of vaccines and, you know, you can keep them around for a couple of years as opposed to attenuated vaccines, which you would have to keep around for like, I don't know, months. So it's harder to stockpile them. You know, they're more useful in situations where you like lack electricity and things like that. And they have an effectively 0% chance of causing an infection, even in an immunocompromised host, or reverting to a pathogenic form. They are dead. D-E-D, -E -D, dead. Um, so the, the vaccine itself is pretty much perfectly safe. Um, the disadvantages. Uh, you don't get any replication in vivo, so you have to give a very large dose of the inactivated virus in order to produce a good immune response. And an immune response is usually what makes you feel sick. So like if you've ever gone to the get your flu shot and then you feel sick with kind of cold and flu-like symptoms for a day or two afterwards, and you think, ah, oh, the virus, you know, the vaccine gave me the virus. No, no it didn't. Uh, but what it did do is fool your immune system into thinking you had a raging infection of the virus. Like they injected a whole buttload of dead virus into you. And your immune system sees, oh my God, there's this, all this virus running around my blood and starts to have a massive reaction to it. You aren't infected. They're dead. But it wouldn't work if your immune system wasn't fooled into thinking that they were alive. And so your immune system is going to respond by making you feel sick because that's what your immune system does when it thinks you've been infected. Um, 
And so you usually have to give a very large initial amount of the virus, which can cause, you know, some unpleasant side effects. They're not dangerous, but they're not fun. Um, and even then, because it's just like the virus is dead, so you give somebody an injection and a couple of days later it's gone out of the blood, uh, that means that you often, in order to produce good, long-lasting immunity, need several boosters, right? So you go in for a shot, and then like you know, a few months later, a few weeks later, you have to go in for a second one. Uh, maybe, uh, you know, two or three years after that, you have to go in for a third. Um, also, you know, dead viruses don't always fool your immune system very well because they're dead. Uh, so for some of them, in order to increase the likelihood of your immune system responding strongly to them, we have to add an adjuvant. An adjuvant is uh, a chemical that makes your immune system respond to the, uh, the vaccine better. And while the vaccine is harmless, the adjuvants have in the past occasionally been toxic. Um, now, we do a much better job of testing the adjuvants today than we used to, but historically, back in like the 60s and 70s, there were a few cases where the adjuvant that we used caused, say, you know, allergic reaction or something in someone. And um, so that can be a problem. Um, so there are advantages and disadvantages to both types of vaccines. Uh, inactivated whole agent vaccines uh, are uh, include um, influenza, rabies, and hepatitis A. Actually, we have influenza vaccines of both sorts. If you get a flu shot, uh, that's a, uh, typically an inactivated vaccine. If you get the nasal spray, where it's like an inhaled vaccine, um, that's usually live attenuated. All right, so um, I guess I do have a few things that I want to add uh, before I let you guys go here. Those are the, uh, those two, attenuated and um, inactivated vaccines are the two most common, and the two most general categories that vaccines come in. Uh, but there are some interesting new styles of vaccines that, uh, that have come into play in recent years. And so I wanted to at least mention them. Um, one is a, uh, basically a, a genetic, genetically engineered or hybrid uh, vaccine, which is where you take a non-pathogenic organism. Say you take a, a bacteria that is harmless and uh, you, so let's say you, you, you have a bacteria that's harmless and you have a virus with specific spike proteins and the virus is harmful. You can use genetic engineering techniques to put the viral spike proteins on the bacteria. The spike proteins don't do anything on their own. They have to be connected to a virus in order to work. But you could then vaccinate someone with this harmless bacteria and uh, hopefully they will produce antibodies to the viral spike protein that you put on it. Uh, there are also um, what are called uh, toxoid vaccines. 
These are where you, you, instead of vaccinating against a virus or a bacteria or a pathogen, you vaccinate against a toxic substance that that bacteria produces. So the tetanus vaccine falls into this category because if you get a tetanus infection, the tetanus bacteria isn't what hurts you. It's actually the toxin that the bacteria makes. Um, so the bacteria could be like, you could mount an immune response and kill off the bacteria and it isn't going to help you if you already still have the toxin in your system. So the, the tetanus vaccine is actually not a vaccine against the tetanus bacteria. It's a vaccine against the tetanus toxin. Uh, again, you know, the, the vaccine will actually bind to the toxin and neutralize it and, um, that's how it protects you. So tetanus and diphtheria, um, and uh, there's actually a vaccine for dogs against rattlesnake bites. Um, those are toxoid vaccines. Um, subunit vaccines use, instead of a live organism or a dead organism, use just part of an organism. Um, so, for instance, the, uh, the hepatitis B vaccine uh, is, doesn't include the, the whole vaccine live or, or the whole virus live or dead. It's just the isolated surface proteins. Um, uh, let's see. And there are a number of experimental viruses as well, or uh, vaccines as well, uh, including a few that try to um, immunize your cytotoxic T cells to produce a, um, a, a cell-mediated response. Uh, so I know of uh, I know of several labs that are trying to produce vaccines against cancer. Uh, the idea is that, you know, there are, there are certain biomarkers that many cancers have. And we know that the immune system actually takes care of most cancers before you even know that you have them. So if you could vaccinate someone against cancer, then you could drastically reduce the likelihood of them getting it. Of course, Cancer is usually gotten rid of by the cell-mediated immune system rather than the humoral immune system. So, yeah, uh, you, you need to then have a vaccine that activates cytotoxic T cells, which is a very different mechanism. So you have to do a lot of research developing a vaccine that's going to stimulate that. That research is ongoing, um, but I don't know of any successful trials yet. All right, so that is vaccines.